Good afternoon and most welcome to How the European Arctic Secures the European Green Deal. My name is Maria Suner and I'm the CEO of Sviamin, the Swedish Association of Mining, Minerals and Metal Producers. And we are one of the co-organizers of this event today, together with Finmin, the region of Västerbotten and North Sweden European Office. And there is an increased need uh, and awareness uh, that metals and minerals are absolutely necessary to combat climate change. The technological solution needed, uh, like windmills, solar PVs and the electrification of the transport sector, together with the electrification of the heavy industries, all needs metals and minerals in order to function and to be able to deliver. And this was also highlighted by the European Commission in the Raw Material Action Plan, together with the critical raw material list that was, was delivered in September last year. And many of these metals and minerals that are pinpointed on this cr critical raw material list are actually uh, possible to extract and produce here in the European Arctic. North Sweden and North Finland. So today's session, we're going to follow one of the value chains that are very important to combat climate change, the battery production value chain. And we're going to start with extraction and move on to battery production and end with recycling today. And this will be a very interesting afternoon with a lot of examples of what, what's happening and what's going on in the uh, Arctic of the European Union. So once again, most welcome to this interesting afternoon on how the European Arctic secures the European Green Deal. And with that, I would like to welcome Emma Hadmark, the Communication Director of Svemin, who is going to be moderating today. Welcome, Emma. Thank you, Maria. Dear ministers, members of parliament, CEOs, directors, executives, Senior advisors, project managers, distinguished guests and participants, very welcome. Today we are broadcasting live from a studio south of Stockholm here in Sweden. Emma Hadmark is my name and I am a director of communications at Svemin. And uh, it's my pleasure to walk you through this afternoon together. And there's a chat window open for you guys and it's on your right hand side of the window. So I exit the full screen mood if you're on uh, watching doing that on, on uh, YouTube. And uh, please share your thoughts and comments on our presentations and panel discussions. We do have a uh, super tight schedule because we have a lot of speakers today. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our first keynote speaker Euromines is a recognized representative of the European metals, minerals and mining industry. And we are proud to have with us today their brand new director, Mr. Rolf Kubi. Thank you, Emma. And uh, first and for all, I want to thank uh, Maria Zuna and Sven Min for organizing this important conference at a very valuable and important time. And uh, I will speak on why is European mining key for the EU Green Deal. Everybody of us is aware that the Green Deal is one of the most ambitious projects of the EU, facing two important challenges, digitalization and decarbonization to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. I will focus in my speech today mainly on the decarbonization, although Digitalization is of utmost importance too. We are all experiencing this every day in these difficult pandemic times. And we need to continue first to limit the negative effects to society and economy of this pandemic. A decarbonized society by 2050 must mobilize all human resources, innovation and technologies available. The Green Deal ambition is to decarbonize the energy sector since production of energy accounts for more of 75% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. We need to renovate, isolate buildings to help people cut their energy bills and energy use since 40% of our, our energy consumption is by buildings. 
support industry to innovate and become global leaders in the green economy. Roll out cleaner forms of private and public transport since transport represents 25% of our emissions. The European mineral and raw materials industry that I represent here today is committed to the Green Deal and we expect the right political framework and actions to happen to provide security to the mining investment to allow the industry to deliver on the Green Deal. Euro Mines covers 42 metals and minerals and 350,000 direct jobs in the EU with a connected value chain representing 25 million jobs in the EU. Being at the beginning of all value chains allows the potential of decarbonization to be passed on downstream along the value chain. Electrification in the extractive industry has radically progressed productivity and energy efficiency in the mining industry is continuously implementing new solution, solution, solutions aiming at the further reducing of energy consumption per unit and improving our carbon intensive operations. Different European mining operators and sectors have already taken the necessary measures and opted for investing in their own alternative electricity generation and supply of renewable energy. This being said, mining sectors in the EU and especially in Scandinavia are the front runners in reducing the carbon footprint per unit of extracted raw materials. And minerals and metals are indispensable enablers for a carbon neutral solutions in all sectors of the economy. Given the scale of fast growing material demand, primary raw materials will continue to provide a large part of the demand next to increasing recycling activities. We know that global demand for minerals and metals is projected to increase exponentially from the climate transition, according to the World Bank by 200% for windmills, 300% in solar panels, and 1000% in batteries. On the other side, Europe's climate progress outpaces other areas of the world, and we could fall behind in the global raw materials race, especially compared with more polluting regions. Decarbonization of mobility housing economy means the substitution of fossil energies by using metals and minerals. In transport, fuels are substituted by batteries containing minerals and metals. In housing, the same happens with PV panels and geothermal heat exchanges. And in energy generation, for example, producing a three megawatt wind turbine requires up to 335 tons of steel, five tons of copper, 1,200 tons of concrete, three tons of aluminum, and many more elements like rare earths. This illustrates the volume of raw materials needed for the green transition. Shifting from a fuel-based society to one with important new infrastructures containing many raw materials. And mining, especially in Scandinavia, has one of the biggest potential to contribute to the successful realization of this Green Deal. However, the Green Deal will only be successful if all Europeans are part of it, including a prosperous industry. The EU Commission must partner today's Green Deal with an equally ambitious industrial strategy, which allows us to make long-term investments into improving our capacity and environmental performance. Bold actions and coherent regulation is needed to establish a level playing field and a fair competition for best performing European companies when other global players are not all subject to the same rules. To meet the scale of Europe's rising raw materials demand, we will need to focus on boosting all stages of the raw materials value chain. That means starting at raw materials autonomy through mining in Europe, looking into new opportunities for sustainable mining and safeguarding our materials base along the value chain. The raw materials industry is highly trade and energy intensive with electricity costs among the 
amounting to approximately 20% of the overall costs. Cost increases cannot be passed on to consumers, especially downstream, uh, cannot be passed to consumers, especially because companies compete at global level and must maintain cost structures comparable to the ones of their international competitors. Therefore, a strong industrial framework securing a reliable, fair international competition, a level playing field, and then unhindered access to raw materials is of key importance for Europeans' prosperity and growth. G given all of the above, without any system force to protect particular aspects affecting the industry competitive, full indirect cost compensation remains an essential part of this climate goals achievements. Ultimately, any carbon related constraints on the upstream sector, the first segment of the integrated product value chain will automatically affect the downstream industries. To complete complement the Green Deal ambition we subscribe to, we, the, we need the master plan for investment along the industrial value chain for mining to industrial products. Thank you for this opportunity to present the expectations towards the Green Deal, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Wolf Kubi, and um, thank you very much for your wise words. Uh, and uh, what you what you said about uh, mining being the beginning of uh, value chains, so that's very much what we are going to focus on this first session of this webinar together. So, thank you. Uh, from Brussels, now over to Helsinki, Finland. The Finnish Minister of Economic Affairs, Mika Lintile, has sent us a welcome address. Dear honorable speakers, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to everyone participating in this special webinar. I am delighted to attend as a keynote speaker in this local event, How the European Arctic Secures the European Green Deal during the EU Industry Week. I will focus on the theme of circular use of raw materials in the mining industry. Finland and Sweden have a shared central opportunity in the industrial sector to join their forces as the leading mining countries and supply Europe with more sustainable raw materials. Finland's very first national battery strategy was launched earlier this year. It is closely linked to the European Union's battery strategy. Both of them aim to build an innovative, competitive and a sustainable battery industry in Europe. Critical raw materials are an essential part of the strategic value chain. Access to resources is essential in carrying out the European Green Deal, which is the growth strategy in the European Union. Therefore, a sustainable supply of critical raw materials and recycling of metals and minerals are crucial. There are major business opportunities in critical raw materials, advanced battery materials and improvement of resources, efficiency and circularity related to them. This is an area where Finland and Sweden already have a strong presence. At the same time, circular use of resources is an essential part of our approach in the European Raw Material Alliance. I am pleased to announce that the Minister of Economic Affairs and Employment of Finland just joined the Alliance. Traceability of minerals, good governance and state-of-the-art of production methods and environmental performance are essential for us. These areas require responsibility and sustainability, which will be our competitive edge in the global market. These actions will speed up our transition towards digital and green economy. Going to the transition in the circular economy, this is a key step on the way to the Finnish government's carbon neutrality target by 2031. 
Uber mining uh, has potential in the carbon neutrality target. The elements to realize this potential are the comprehensive collection and valuable waste to products. In addition, efficient technologies is essential to recover the valuable raw materials from the waste products in the economic way. Finland has prepared a strategic program making the circular economy a sustainable foundation of Finland's economy. With this program, Finland wants to strengthen its role as a leader in the circular economy. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude with these words, I wish you all a fruitful event on how the European artist secures the European Green Deal. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Lintele. Thank you very much for those kind words. You, I guess you noticed that he mentioned the importance of traceability. And uh, I could give you a, a in, hint that we will dig in more to traceability in the third session of this afternoon, starting at three o'clock. I would like to encourage you to talk about this event in social media, on Twitter, LinkedIn and so forth. And please use the has hashtag EU Industry Week. So hashtag EU Industry Week is the hashtag that we use for today. In January this year, OECD published a much acclaimed report on a topic closely related to what we are focusing on this afternoon. The Swedish regions of Västerbotten and Norrbotten as sustainable leaders in mining. Here is their report. And uh, we will now, uh, I would like to introduce to you two of the author of this report. Uh, please welcome policy analyst Lisan Radeshal and Andres Sanabria. Lisan, please share your screen. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy that we're here today and that we, we got the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I hope that everybody can share and uh, can see the, the screen that was shared. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, today we would like to talk to you a little bit more about how regional policy making um, can foster sustainable mining, especially in the case of the regions of Westerbotten and Norbotten in Sweden. Next slide, please. So just to give you a bit of a background how the, how the OECD is approaching this topic. We, so Andres and Mike, uh, who's going to be joining me later today, Andres and I were working on a unit that's called regional and rural development. So we look at this from a spatial perspective. And our logic is that mining has a relevance to regional development. And while mining is a global business um, and trading all over the world, it's very spatially concentrated and it has an impact on the local economies and on the local people. So for instance, we can see that often in mining, uh, mining regions, there are very high paid jobs, there's innovation and technological innovation, there's investment in infrastructure and services, even though these places are often very remote. And often also, as we will discuss today further, there's really opportunities for regional growth from transitioning to a green economy. But also, on the other hand, obviously, we see localized impacts. We see environmental impacts from mining that need to be mitigated. There's great growth volatility because there's boom and bust cycles in mining often that are impacting these local economies, especially if, they're low, uh, if they have low diversification. There's high productivity, but also uneven distribution of benefits. So not always everybody in the community benefits from the mining that's going on. Next slide, please. So for this case study, we specifically looked at two, the two most northern regions of Sweden, Västerbotten and Norrbotten. They together make up the region of Upper Norland, as many of you would know. Currently, there's nine out of 12 active mines in Sweden, and all these, these mines produce 90% of the iron ore produced in Europe. This is essential to secure the green transition, as we've already heard. But it's not only the traditional mining that's already occurring in these regions, but it's also really the potential for further minerals that, can, that are lying there in the ground and that are very much needed to further this process. 
Next slide. So when we've looked, we've taken a closer look in, at these two regions and at their regional development perspective, we've seen specific assets and bottlenecks. So, so the specific geographic location and the large minerals reserve that are present in these two counties and that, that are there to be discovered for the green transition is really important essence for their development. But also they have a generally a structure of high income, low unemployment, amongst or in comparison to Sweden, but also other mining regions. They have mining companies that are really at the technological uh, frontier and working closely with universities and a skilled labor force to make uh, sure that the, the technologicals they are using and the emissions um, are becoming environmentally friendly. Also, there's good infrastructure accessibility. There's green and reliable energy and high broadband coverage. This is also really crucial for, for sustaining the regional development opportunities. But then on the other hand, we also see that there's high use out migration in the region, especially of women who seek to migrate to the larger cities that are located on the coastline. But also there's really low interaction of municipality and smaller business in the innovation process that is already going on with larger firms and the universities. So these, these players that are really important also in regional development are outside of the dialogue that's currently happening. Also, the high specialization of the mining has led to a lock-in effect of a lot of the local businesses and has decreased the entrepreneurship levels in the region. And on top of that, we have observed a complex regulatory framework that lacks a regional development considerations and makes it hard for especially small firms to set foot in the region. Also, there is persistent gaps between land use planning and regional development in the administrative system, which often can create blockages in planning and there's really a need to bridge sort of these, these administrative gap and to reduce the land use conflicts that are currently present in the region. And now I'll pass to Andres, who will explain a little bit more about what needs to be done to unlock this potential of the region to become a global leader in environmental sustainable mining. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so as as you mentioned in the, the, the two speakers at the beginning of this event, in this opening remarks uh, mentioned, the, the regulatory framework is uh, quite uh, highly important for, to, to unlock these kind of uh, uh, possibilities to, to align uh, mining and, and, and the Green Deal. Uh, and also is, is quite relevant the political will. So based on these assets that we identified in these two regions and, and the challenges, uh, coupled with this uh, new moment for, for the Green Deal, uh, the chapter had and the, and the case study identified uh, seven group of actions that we think uh, these regions uh, should uh, put in motion to become a global leader in technologies and practices for environmentally sustainable mining. This is not only something for the region as, as as we know, is mining is localized, but it's something that also will help the the, uh, the nation and, and Sweden uh, in in becoming this this uh, this global leader in in this in this type of technologies. We have among the seven uh, uh, recommendations. I would like to focus on on three, four. First is we need a clear political guideline. We need to, to a clear vision from the national level and from the region on what is the role of mining for development. So that is something that national mining strategies do, but that is something that normally gets quickly updated. And, and this is the case for Sweden. So we, we need a, an a up-to-date uh, national mining strategy that also capture the value uh, of this uh, industry for the local communities. Uh, Enhancing the local uh, ecosystem of innovation is quite key, especially in these mining regions where uh, big companies are the driver of innovation. Uh, so far, is 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 giving uh, important results. Uh, we we have these regions being at the core of at the front for of technology in process of uh, iron transformation and reduction of. CO2 consumption and resources consumption for the transformation of minerals. 
but we need that these regions, if we want to make a, a sector sustainable, we need, we need that these regions involve municipalities, we mean local governments and SMEs in this, innov in, in this innovative process. We also require uh, cooperation, international cooperation uh, with other regions of Europe. This is not only to define a common vision for mining that, that, that still has a lot of uh, contradictors in, uh, and, and, and growing contradictors in, in Europe, but it's also to coordinate environmental agendas and, and, and the role of the sector for, for the environment. Uh, as we mentioned, the regulatory framework is key. So we need clear and predictable timelines and limits for decision-making, especially for, for the permitting process. We have seen, and this is not only for this region, but it's for, for many regions, that permits take, uh, tend to take more time than that was expected for, for industry. Uh, that with the price volatility, with the, with the fast uh, movement of technology, that implies some risk for investment. So we need this predictability, and that can be done from the regulation. Uh, we need also the windows of, of opportunity, for, uh, the windows of dialogue and feedback with the local communities, also to, to take into account the, the, whole, the, all, the whole accumulative impacts of these projects on the culture and the environment and the economy. Uh, important, and, and just to, to close, uh, the, the link of regional development and with land, land use planning. So it's important to, to, to do this, this coordination. I thank we'll thank you very much. Like thank you very much, yep. uh, Andres Sanabria, uh, author of this uh, OECD report. Uh, I guess it's downloadable from your site. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Lisa and Radishal and, and Andres Sanabria, for this presentation. Uh, we won't have time to for any follow-up questions, I'm afraid. But uh, anyone interested to read more in it, it's worth reading. Uh, please download this report from the OECD website. Thank you. As we uh, are speaking now, the, uh, the company of Bo Leiden is having their Capital Markets Day. And um, uh, therefore, Mr. Bo Leiden himself have, has sent us his uh, pre-recorded address. And he has promised, some, promised to share some interesting news. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, I have no possibility to be with you live today, so this has been recorded beforehand. I hope that you've all had very good presentations up to this point. Uh, my name is Mika Staffas. I'm the CEO of Bulliden, and I will talk to you slightly or briefly about what we are doing and what we can do going forward. We have uh, a long history. We've been around for about 100 years, and we've been in the base metal space, and we are today in the whole value chain from exploration through to mine design, mine planning. We are into smelting, we're smelting, and we're recycling the metals uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, in all of these aspects, we are one of the leading companies in Europe, both in terms of size, but also in terms of the uh, advancedness that we have in terms of the technology that we use and also the ESG footprint that we have. Let me start a little bit with the ESG footprint because that's very important. Let's start with safety. Uh, this industry has developed enormously over the last few years. If you go back 30 or 40 years, it was not unusual that you would have several fatalities per year in a mining company. We have today 13 years without any fatal accidents in our industrial areas, which is unique to the world. And if you take anybody in a similar size, they will have fatalities more or less every year. We have achieved this by a very hard work over the years to, to achieve what we consider to be very safe uh, workspaces, but that's of course not the end. We will continue to work with this to be able to continue to have this trend moving on forward. Now, base metals are extremely important for everybody else to be able to achieve their targets. Uh, you can look on the European level, and I'm sure you'll talk about this, that roughly 75% of all uh, CO2 reduction programs that you see in other industries are totally dependent on electrification and thus totally dependent on the metals that we have, the base metals. Uh, they can only achieve roughly 25% with other measures that don't require the metals. And I think that you will get many of these uh, chances to discuss how needed they are. 
I will talk more about how we in Bouleden have over time not just produced the metals that are needed for everybody else, but also done it in a very climate friendly way. We are today actually uh, and launching a new low carbon product. We will uh, be able to sell part of our uh, copper production, which comes from our own mines through to our own smelters, that will be less than 1.5 kilo of CO2 per kilo of copper. This is probably one of the lowest copper footprint uh, or CO2 footprint, I say, copper in the world that you can find. Uh, and we will be able to certify somewhere around 30% of our production to this level. We also have a second product where we are launching today, which is also about 1.5 kilo of CO2 per kilo of copper, but that one is fully recycled based. And uh, we will also announce today that we have already have 25% of this production signed up at premiums and we will have a very big interest from other customers to be able to sign up for the rest. Now, what do we do with the, everything else then that is not this low carbon copper? Well, we're working very hard to make sure that also our standard copper remains one of the most uh, climate friendly copper in the world. Uh, and we will continue to work on that. And here, of course, we are very optimistic on longer term that we will get the lava project come through because the lava project will also produce copper that is around one and a half kilo of CO2 per kilo of copper, which is the, um, the benchmark that we're now setting for low carbon copper. By the way, in this uh, calculations, we have included <coughs> all the CO2 ranging from uh, producing the explosives to, for, to actually using the explosives and then all the uh, CO2 that's needed in the mining and in the smelting process to do finished copper. Uh, this benchmark is difficult to get from other parts of the world, but our assessment is that if you were to calculate the same way, the average copper in the world is probably around six. Uh, we are, as I said, very, very uh, satisfied with the amount of CO2 that we have today. But that doesn't mean that we're not continuing to strive. We have a target to reduce these very low levels that we have today with 40% up until 2030 uh, with a base level of 2012. Uh, this is ambitious targets, but we have a very good ongoing action list to be able to achieve these targets in this time frame. We will also talk today about uh, the fact that this is uh, the Scandinavian uh, geology is not at the end. We are today launching a new find up in the Bouliden area called Strömfors. That could be a new mine in a couple of years if everything works out fine. Uh, and we have also, if you read our R&R statement, they are now about a, a month old. Uh, you can also see that we also during 2020, despite COVID and everything else, managed to continue the trick that we do every year of expanding our mines for one year uh, extra with every year of production. And actually in Aitik and in Garpenberg, we were much more successful in that. We managed to expand the life of mine with more than five years in one year of production. So with that, I wish you all a very good conference. I'm sure you will discuss all these issues uh, more, even more, how much the world need base metal, what the deficit is in Europe in terms of base metals, and also how Europe can produce base metals that are much more sustainable than from the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mikael Staffas. And uh, it was comforting to hear you say that uh, Scandinavian geology is not at its end. I think that's, that's good news. Well, in November last year, the European iron ore giant in the north of Sweden, LKAB, revealed the plans for their largest industrial investment in Sweden ever. Some 40 billion euros, and I repeat, 40 billion euros, will be spent to make the smooth transition into a fossil-free future for LKAB. We are delighted to have with us today the president and CEO of LKAB, Jan Moström. This floor oh. is yours. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can put on my presentation. It seems to have some difficulties for me to control it. Yes. But what I will talk about is how can we participate in the, the important task of securing the European Green Deal? 
being one or the iron ore producers with the lowest carbon footprint as is today producing um, pellets, our aim is to take the next step forward. And if we could have the next slide. What we have recognized is one of the most important parts of uh, securing the Green Deal is to go in the first uh, stage to fossil free iron or steel. And the next step is to go into carbon dioxide free iron. And uh, what we are actually doing, if you take the next slide, is to increase the, um, the uh, product as we are producing today. We are going from uh, iron ore or iron ore pellets into spong iron. The challenge in that is to uh, replace the carbon in the blast furnace with uh, hydrogen from electrolysis. But uh, by doing that, we will reduce substantially our impact on uh, the climate change. Even if we are among the largest uh, emitters of carbon dioxide in Sweden today, we are roughly producing or, or emitting 700,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide is the vast uh, volume of, of carbon dioxide in our products as iron ore consists of iron and oxygen. If we take the next slide, what also is uh, important for us developing our new set of, of uh, of products is also to utilize one mineral we have in our iron ore and that is appetite. In that mineral we have a, an a impact or, or a volume of both phosphorus and rare earth elements and by using the technology necessary for producing uh, carbon dioxide free spong iron that means that we have to have access to hydrogen we also could be a producer and will be a producer of uh, phosphor and, um, and rare earth elements. If we take the next slide. If we then go to, to uh, the production side, we initiated two and a half, three years ago in the mine side, how to become even more um, more climate friendly in our mine, mining operations. So we initiated a uh, development program together in participation with Sandvik, Epiroc, uh, Combitech and ABB to develop a new world stan standard regarding mining operations. And the intention is to make the operations fully automized and electrified. And as I also already mentioned, also to develop technology methodology for carbon dioxide free spong iron and rare earth elements and phosphorus. If we take the next slide, when we have converted the whole uh, operations within LKB, and of course that is a gigantic task that probably will start within our operations in Malmberget. We will reduce the total emission from our products with 35 million tons of carbon dioxide. As uh, the bulk of our uh, products is um, exported, this means that one part will be reduced within the boundaries of Sweden, but uh, the majority will be reduced mainly in Europe. Of course, doing a transition like this, both going into a fossil and carbon dioxide free mining operations and also to start to produce uh, products that are free of emissions, we have a lot of challenges. And if we take the next slide, what we have identified is Perhaps one of the most challenging areas is how we could improve the permit process. Uh, what we can say is the necessity of finding a policy coherence between the demand for a more climate efficient industry, but also to find ways without having any 
impact on, on our environment to increase the efficiency of our permit processes, because that will probably be one of, of the, the most challenging areas. Of course, we have a lot of other areas that need to be addressed, for example, that we are now going down and, and uh, see at least in our plans that we will reach 2000 meters underground. And that will be in comparison with our uh, competitors that is operating uh, open pits. But uh, these challenges is what we are going to, uh, so to say, offset the years to come as we going from planning to, to uh, pursuing our strategy. And with that, I is done with my presentation. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Um, for anyone interested in looking closer into your the slides that you were showing, uh, this I can say that this uh, webinar is being recorded and it will be uh, available on the Svemen YouTube channel uh, shortly after we have finished the last session. And a quick reminder, uh, please share your thoughts and comments uh, in uh, our chat window. Uh, on our YouTube channel and, and comment on uh, what you hear and your thoughts, if you agree or disagree on what's being said. For our closing panel discussion, we have three experienced individuals, each bringing their view on the topic of this session, mineral extraction, in terms of how the European Arctic can secure your, the European Green Deal. We have one politician, we have one CEO, and one education manager. Welcome. So, uh, you're all here, I can see. Uh, what You've all been listening uh, to this webinar up until now. Uh, and uh, what is your primary takeaway if you are to say one thing that you have want to highlight? Linda Modig, for example, our politician. Thank you. I'd like to underline what uh, the OECD and also CEO Jan Moström led forward when it comes to the challenges about the permitting procedure in Sweden that really needs to shape up to speed up and be more efficient and foreseeable. That's, that's the baseline for Sweden when it comes to the challenges ahead. What do you say from the Finnish side? Yes, uh, so this is Joni Lukkaroiden, the CEO of Terrafame. So, uh, I think it was very interesting to, to hear the presentations and uh, I, I think uh, we heard that uh, that Bully didn't have the lowest uh, CO2 footprint uh, in the global in copper, also LKAB in, in uh, iron ore, we do have the same uh, when it comes to nickel. So I think uh, also what uh, was discussed earlier today, I, I think it's fair to say that, that uh, mining is a solution for a more green world. And this is something that uh, we should understand uh, nationwide, hopefully European wide, uh, that, uh, that mining is indeed a solution, not, not a problem like uh, quite often is seen. That cannot be stressed enough. I agree. Uh, what do our third panelists say, Theo Bertet of the EIT Raw Materials? I think I do agree with what uh, Linda and Johnny just said, but I have to say that as a geoscientist in education, I will have to emphasize the fact that Scandinavian geology is not finished, as it has been emphasized by Mr. Bully, then, as you say. And, and I think it's really full of perspective for the coming students and, and, and the geology of Scandinavia and the supply of raw materials for Europe. So uh, if I go back, to, thank you very much, Theo. And uh, if I go back to, to, uh, to Linda Modig, our politician, what do you see is the most important or urgent action that you can take in your political role to address that uh, uh, challenge that you were mentioning? I think at the, the European level, we need to be closely watching the development when it comes to the legal situation with the environmental law within the European Union. I'm a little bit concerned when it comes to the application uh, or for instance, um, the water framework directive or the nature 2000. I can feel that the um, development is really accelerating 
and uh, in a short while it will not be possible for any extraction industry, not only the mining business, but all the others. So that's one great challenge at the European level. But then again, at the national level, we have severe challenges ahead. And one of the most important is the permitting procedure that really needs to speed up and be more efficient, be more predictable, because I mean, that's a basic um, principle for any rule of law. And I think that Sweden is lagging when it comes to the competition because of the lack of, of efficient procedures, permitting procedures. Mm. Thank you, Linda. Um, uh, Theo, what do you say from your perspective? What, what, what can you do in your role to, uh, to facilitate the uh, sustainable raw materials extraction like in, in order for, for the north of, of Scandinavia and the Nordics uh, to, to secure the Green Deal? You were stressing I, education, the importance of education earlier. What can you do? How, how do you how do you, how do you address this challenge? I I have to say, Emma, that 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 working in the in the northern hub of EIT raw material, my job is quite facilitated because of this great collaboration between the extractive industry, the academy, the research organization, but also the communes. But I I I do think that that there, that we have in the north and in the Scandinavia, really leading industries. And, and we should continue to leading by example. And, and we see an industry that is performing uh, in, in what they deliver today. And we've seen that today with, with the announcement. And I will be really happy to be able to, to buy coppers and to buy copper where I know uh, what is the, 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 the carbon footprint. But I think that, I, I, I do think that on a national level, uh, we need we need to continue have political support. Uh, it's really important, but also gain this social license to to operate through good examples and make sure that that the investment, both private and public, that are needed to reach this ambitious goal of the Green Deal, uh, are, 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 are will will be made possible, and and the uncertainty will decrease in this project. What, what do you, uh, uh, Mr. Lucaro, uh, what, what do you see as the most urgent action that you can take in your role as a CEO of a large company in Finland? Uh, perhaps I, if you may, I would uh, like to to uh, to go back uh, what uh, Linda said and then perhaps sure, uh, to, to to stress uh, the importance of uh, predictable and uh, and uh, efficient uh, permitting process. Uh, uh, it, it was good, of course, to hear that in, in, in Sweden, uh, you think that uh, that uh, you are not competitive against uh, other uh, countries, but in Finland, we definitely think that uh, that, uh, that in Finland, we would have room to, to improve uh, this part of the, the process. And some of the European wide regulations, like already mentioned, uh, this VAS Weser directive or, or the water uh, framework, directive is is uh, putting even more pressure on on uh, how this can can be done so i, I think uh, from the industry we are of course fully committed uh, to 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 make uh, sustainable mining and sustainable refining uh, in uh, finland we think that it will be our competitive edge uh, to many other countries that we do have possibilities uh, for low carbon footprint uh, very sustainable uh, mining activities, but uh, we need uh, further investments, and, and and these investments are very difficult unless we have a very good uh, predictive uh, permitting process. I agree, uh, definitely. That's really the main challenge for for the mining industry all over. Um, uh, if I, if I stay with uh, with you. Um, uh, you have an uh, integrated production process at, in, in your uh, where you're working and uh, please tell us what that means this integrated production process yes uh, we do have here in in Kainu region in, in Sotkamo uh, uh, fully integrated operation from the mining uh, currently to 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 metal intermediate production and very soon uh, we will be also starting up our our battery chemicals production plant and what this means is that that uh, that uh, there are basically three benefits from uh, from this integration one is that that uh, when our customers want sustainability and uh, sustainability is is uh, nothing unless you can actually trace it back 
and in our case when we are all the way from mining to to to, to refining and the chemicals production of course uh, traceability is easy to to organize could I, sorry could uh, i just jump in there uh, uh, no. do you do you see a demand from your customers in an increased uh, sustainability uh, yes we do so if if looking uh, all our production is aimed for for battery application and uh, there is of course uh, today uh, this uh, battery uh, value chain is quite a lot in asia where perhaps the uh, the demand for is is not as high as as in europe so if looking the european oem uh, that is definitely coming to us and i could even say that one of the challenges for us is uh, both sweden and finland is to have a a standards that we can demonstrate the sustainability and uh, standards that would be uh, also accepted by the by the customers. Mm. Uh, but if I may continue, you were Please. asking about this integration. So uh, another uh, topic is that when we are in the same site in uh, refining, we, we do uh, remove impurities. And in our case, uh, when we can uh, put uh, impurities back to, uh, to upstream production and, and sell copper as an example, as a copper and not an impurity in, in nickel. This is of course a benefit and improving the material efficiency. But perhaps the biggest thing uh, for in our case is that this allows us to have very attractive carbon footprint. So our uh, carbon footprint is the lowest uh, globally in nickel production partly because of our bioleaching technology that we use, but, but also partly because of the integration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm curious about this, that I, I, I am jumped in and asked you about the, the customer, the demand for, for increased sustainability uh, from the industry. And um, my question is to, to uh, Linda Mudig, our politician. Do you see that the uh, demand of, uh, demand by customers on uh, uh, buying or getting hold of uh, products that are sustainably produced. Is that enough to make a change or do we need to change some legal parts for in order to, to make a, a, a faster or a more profound change? Yes, I agree because we have a world leading industry. They are now taking the leadership when it comes to the whole transition towards a fossil free future. So I would say that there are two main problems, the legal ones that I pointed out and also the people's attitudes. We have a large problem with the NIMBY phenomena, especially in Sweden, but also in other modern countries, not in my backyard. This concerns not only the mining and exploration industry, but also the windmills. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves green energy, but nobody wants to have it in, in their area. And this is this we need really to come forward to make people realize uh, that in order to have all the nice things like the windmills or the cell phones or whatever, we need to, to really use the raw material the raw materials that we have in our fantastic bedrock. I mean, we have the Fanuskende and shield in our area. Let's let's work with that. And we have the a really strict and strong regulation when it comes to the environmental uh, legislation. What we really need is better, smoother application of the legislation. So I think that we policymakers and decision makers, we need to sp speed up. We need to. Uh, take better leadership because uh, the industry is already running. The customers are or having these products. So I think that if we want to, to come forward, it's we as decision makers to, to, to need to improve ourselves, actually. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, sometimes, actually, I do, I do agree, Linda. Uh, it feels like the industry is, is one step ahead of the, the politicians in, in, in some respects. Um, uh, and my last question is for you, uh, Theo Bertet. Um, what, what role do you see that the uh, education has to secure the future of the uh, Arctic, the green, the mining in the Arctic? And actually, I mean more the, the future of the Green Deal. What, what role does education have in this? I mean, it has a big role, both on the short and the long term. I think we've, we've been talking about, about environment and we also have a young generation that is basically striking for climate. Uh, and I think that that they, you know, in 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 seven years time, they will be the workforce. So we have to also convince them that mineral extraction and the raw material is part of the solution and is a key to what they are fighting for. In my opinion, hmm. I think that's uh, our excellent.
um, final words from our closing panel. Thank you very much, all three of you. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, I would like to say thank you to all previous speakers and thank you to all you participants uh, for this first session this afternoon. And the next session is on battery production. Like Maria Suner, the CEO of Svemen mentioned, we will go along the value chain. So the battery production is our next stop and that session will start at two o'clock sharp. So see you soon. And let's continue to dig into how the European Arctic can secure the European Green Deal.
Welcome back to the local event of EU Industry Week. We are here to explain how the European Arctic can secure the European Green Deal. My name is Emma Hadmark and I'm a director of communications at SWIM in the Swedish Mining Association. And I, it's my pleasure to walk you through this second session of today. And we will focus on battery production. Northern Europe is obviously the place to be when it comes to battery production these days. We have a cost competitive and fossil free energy and uh, there's a rich metal and mineral resource sort of resources, and we have a highly knowledge based workforce. Our first speaker is uh, the director of enterprise and innovation social development at region Westerbotten, Jonas Lundström. Thank you very much, and um, I also would like to wish you all welcome to this second part of, of today. Uh, the logic of, of this day follows the logic of, of the, um, uh, the value chain. We start with extraction and now we're concluding with the completion of the whole value chain. Uh, I represent region Westerbotten, uh, one of the key regions and location that sums up both the opportunities to uh, make a, a better, uh, better use of, of um, virgin minerals, as well as facing the challenges of electrification, and uh, which is manifested at most by the construction of the North Vault site. Uh, our focus as a region is in making sure that the quality of life and living makes it possible and also valuable to come here and to stay here. That's why we are active in, in uh, both the initiative that was explained earlier on, the OECD mining regions, where we think that there is a good opportunity to meet and to discuss within the, the key actors of the, on the regional level throughout the world. But we are also uh, seeing our duties, especially in bringing the cities and municipalities together on the local level and uh, to make sure that the quality of living, education, culture, and all of the key aspects of life is brought upon us in the best of ways. Um, during this session, we are going to hear from uh, Northolt as well as other drivers of this uh, challenge towards uh, a battery region. And um, we are very proud and we are very willing to be a very active part on that from the public side. Um, so without much further ado, let's begin the new session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you very much. From a Westerbotten perspective to a Brussels and EU perspective. Last year, the EU Commission launched the EU Raw Materials Action Plan based on the updated list of critical raw materials. And in the epicenter of all this is Director Peter Hanley, he is head of Unit 1, Energy Intensive Industries and Raw Materials at DJ Grow. Please, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. The, uh, the European Union is committed to the Paris Agreement and the transition to climate neutrality. And the European Green Deal is our vehicle for taking the lead in becoming a climate neutral continent based on sustainability, green energy and circular economy. This ambitious goal will require significant changes in our economies and our supply chains, and this includes the raw material supply chains. We will need a secure and sustainable supply of raw materials to meet the needs of the clean and digital technologies, including batteries and e-mobility. And this will need to be addressed by rethinking the way we consume resources uh, how we become more circular, and by ensuring that new mining and refining activity is done as sustainably as possible. The action plan on critical raw materials that we presented last September sets out the concrete steps to achieve this. It presents 10 actions to develop resilient EU value chains, be more circular, do more sustainable sourcing and processing in the EU and to diversify our supply from resource-rich countries in the rest of the world. 
The minerals sector in the Arctic regions of Finland and Sweden has always been at the forefront when it comes to technological developments, sustainability and formulating policy. You in your regions are moving forward in reducing the carbon dioxide footprint of mining activities by developing technologies to improve the way that um, raw materials are extracted and processed. And you're also sensitive to the importance of protecting the Arctic environment and respecting the communities that live there. In the battery value chain, Finland and Sweden stand out with involvement in both important projects of common European interest. Um, you have Kelleber for raw and advanced battery materials. You have Northvolt for battery cell manufacturing. You also have Valmet Automotive for battery systems and Fortum, Kelleber again, and Valmet Automotive for recycling. You're represented throughout the value chain. Now, these important projects of common European interest or IPCIs, they are about research and innovation, collaboration across national and sectoral boundaries, and European-wide spillover effects. IPCIs do not fund mass manufacturing, but they do help to bridge the gap between research and innovation and manufacturing. The state aid part also leverages a much larger volume of private investment. The two battery IPCIs approved so far involve around 6 billion euros of state aid, but also around 15 billion euros of private money. IPCIs accelerate investment. The ambition of our industrial policy is to have an industry that creates value added jobs in all regions across Europe. An industry that is driven by innovation, quality and respect for the environment, rather than based on lowering labor costs uh, or the, the cheapest possible raw material inputs. And batteries are a perfect illustration of what we're trying to achieve. We started by building a strong alliance, the European Batteries Alliance. And I think all stakeholders recognize that this alliance and the action plan that the commission produced in 2018 set a convincing path uh, forward. The results are visible already with investments in all segments of the battery value chain and in almost all member states. The EU has become a battery investment hotspot. We've also looked at the regulatory framework. And last December, we made a proposal for a batteries regulation which should ensure that batteries perform at a high level, that they're safe, and that they are produced sustainably. The Commission proposal addresses the entire battery life cycle, from transparent supply chains for battery raw materials, through provisions for recycling and material recovery, to minimum recycled content for future batteries. Together, these provisions should ensure that we mainstream circularity and reinforce secondary raw material markets. And battery cell production in the EU could bring a lot of jobs with it. We estimate between 60 and 90,000 direct jobs and around double that number upstream jobs. These are numbers which go to 2030. And that is why investment in skills is so important. And we're therefore proposing to use the EU Pact for Skills to help define the skills that will be needed in the regions where batteries are going to be produced. I would like to finish now by thanking the raw materials and batteries community in the Arctic regions of Finland and Sweden for organizing today's event and for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Henley, for these kind words. I have a few questions for you just to follow up on a few things. Uh, you mentioned that we here in the Nordics uh, always have been at the forefront in mining, but what do you see as our role uh, to fulfill the purpose of the EU Raw Materials Action Plan, I mean, from now on into the future? Yeah, well, I think um, there's a number of things. We are we're taking value from the work that's been done in the Nordic region on sustainable mining. And this has um, heavily influenced the principles on sustainable mining 
that we're currently finalizing with the raw materials supply group and which were mentioned in the uh, European Batteries Alliance ministerial just last Friday. So sustainable mining is one thing that we think uh, your regions can, can help us very much with. The other is very uh, obviously that you have a lot of the battery raw materials, you have a lot of the mining expertise and that expertise extends down into the processing, refining, and increasingly the recycling of these raw materials. So I think you're very well placed to be a real industrial hub for, um, for batteries across the whole value chain and to help develop links with other regions in the uh, European Union, which will be, if you like, the downstream manufacturing sectors, which will be big um, uh, 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 demandeur for the for the products that you're producing in the Nordic region. Mm. Would you say that there is any specific action that uh, the EU, I mean the Commission, sees should be targeted by the Nordic countries? I mean, in order to meet this uh, raw materials action plan, what should we do? I think you should be focusing on accelerating investment. This is very much in line with the message that the European Commission has been saying since COVID-19, that we should use this as an opportunity to accelerate the green and digital transition and to reinforce resilience. So we hope that um, the Nordic uh, member states will be putting projects in their national recovery plans and also considering putting investments in place through the Just Transition Fund or the Cohesion Fund. All of these tools are, are there to be used to accelerate the green and digital transition. Thank you very much, Peter Henley, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Now over to the perspective of the researcher on research on battery production. And Peter Handley mentioned the importance of cell production, battery cell production. And there sure is a lot to study uh, in this, like Peter Handley was stressing, this super hot field of research. And uh, Professor Ulla Lassi of Ulu University, she has spent a lot of time uh, recently to find out how to improve sustainability of battery chemicals and battery cell production. Professor Lassi, please enlighten us. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. So as I said, I promised to uh, introduce how to improve the sustainability of the existing lithium ion batteries. So I'm heading this uh, research group of sustainable chemistry at the University of Oulu here in Finland. And, and we have worked with the lithium ion batteries already almost 15 years. Uh, mostly with the existing chemistries towards to high nickel materials. Uh, a part of our research group is uh, located not only in Oulu campus, but also in Kokkola. And as you know, this area on the North Sweden and, and East, East area in, in Finland is very important to us for collaborating with several industrial companies. And of course, we have this biggest industrial uh, uh, consortia of inorganic chemistry here in, in Kokkola. Uh, my main focus has been on, on the preparation of active electrode materials, most of these cathode materials and the characterization of them, but we have also involved it in, in the recycling issues and together with some companies, we have patented processes, for example, for alkaline batteries recycling here in Finland. Uh, Shortly, what I like to tell you today is that I will introduce how we make the existing batteries more sustainable. Uh, one is that, of course, we use uh, secondary raw materials uh, when we are producing these nice looking cathode materials in our laboratory. And we are also seeking for solution to, to reuse the sodium sulfate. Uh, one a new idea has been that it has been used as uh, solvent in electrolyted neutral pickling of, of steel surfaces. But in addition to improve the sustainability of the raw materials, also we can do a lot in, in the uh, in development of the sustainability of the cells. Uh, for example, we can improve the material efficiency by, by new coating approaches and so on. Uh, one is that we carry out the cell design 
to new way and we take new coating approach and we improve the safety with the new types of the electrolytes and also improve the recyclability by, by uh, using green solvents and, and for example halogen free binders. I believe that lithium ion batteries have a back uh, with 30 years, and I think that they have also the future of 30 next years with these modifications. One example, together with the Boolean and Coca-Cola, we have used the anode slats you see here, and we have uh, refined it to, to uh, manganese sulfate, and we have then used it manganese sulfate to make the active electrode material coated. And as you see, we have tested those uh, pouch cells in our laboratory and we see that actually these small amounts of the impurities are not affecting at all to the cell performance. So basically there is a lot of potential to use uh, secondary raw material flows for battery products. Then as a new idea, we have combined the competence of printed electronics at, at the University of Oul for making sustainable lithium ion battery cells we have one project together with the Lula University, for example, but we are working with that and also with VTT here in, in Finnish side. So the idea comes from that, that we are screen printing the electrode foils and, and we are approaching it that we can uh, improve the material efficient coating. We use less material than normally and we can make a new packages so that we have also package volumes are very effective. And last but not least, we can also replace some harmful uh, solvents we use in cell assembling like the NMP. It can be replaced and, and what with uh, more environment friendly solvents and, and it fits very well for cathode and anode printing. So towards material efficient coating and towards the use of greener solvents, additives and binders in the existing battery cell production. And this screen printing we are using as a, as a method for making batteries that is the good because we can then also improve the high volume printing capacity. So basically we can print our cell foils roll to roll, which is a very efficient uh, process for upscaling. And it is not only efficient, it is also very energy efficient and material efficient method, method for high volume production. And combined with that uh, use of screener solvents, we can make already the existing battery manufacturing much more sustainable that, than it is currently. And then with the new type of the cells uh, design from stacking to, for example, coplanar, we can also improve the volume efficiency. So thank you a lot uh, for inviting me to be a speaker today. Thank you very much, Professor Lassi. I, I just have one question that's uh, on really interest, some really interesting research that you are doing and uh, really solving one of the really hot topics like we were talking about of today, this time era that we live in. I mean, getting the right amount of uh, money or budget for your research is like a constant struggle for everybody, all researchers across the world. I mean, Having um, uh, doing your research in such an interesting field, if you were from one day to the other had twice as much money and your research budget, how would you spend it? Uh, okay, first of course I will recruit more people and outside Finland and outside Europe because uh, we have to improve the uh, competence more still, even we have a long-term <laughs> background. And, and then of course, one issue is that I think that the, co uh, the correct competence and let's say cost efficiency uh, for, for Finland, for Sweden comes from, uh, from, the, from the cell production, but also from, from the sustainability issues we can improve. So basically, uh, for example, if we like to get some battery manufacturing for Finland, I think that uh, this kind of new approach for cell, cell production would be, uh, would be a good solution because there are so many battery products now estimated to build up in Europe. So maybe in Finland we should uh, uh, 
uh, get the ideas from our own strong areas. We already use, for example, print, uh, screen printing for making RF antennas uh, here in our area. Thank you very much, Professor Ulla Lassi from Oldo University. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I'd like to all participants to remind you that uh, please share your thoughts and, and uh, write your comments uh, on in the chat window to the right hand side of the screen. Uh, and uh, please dis please keep on discuss what we hear there. Do you agree with the previous speaker or do you disagree or why do you agree or disagree? Please let's talk about it over there. And. Uh, now over to the uh, battery front runner here in Sweden that's been mentioned several times already, Northvolt. Northvolt has very high ambitions and I know that the entire company has worked extremely hard these last few years and it seems to be paying off. Northvolt is now very close to opening, actually opened the first production line in Skellefteå in Sweden. We have with us today Hanna Schweitz, Director of Raw Materials at North Vault, and we are very happy to have you here today. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to he be here. Uh, I hope uh, I will get some help to share my presentation. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Uh, so, uh, like she said, I'm, I'm Hanna Schweitz. Uh, I'm responsible for buying the raw materials we need for our gigafactories. Uh, and I can tell you that they are just growing in, in both size and numbers. So we're going to need a lot of raw materials. Uh, so I'm very uh, thankful for the mining industry we have here and that they want to, to take, the, take on this challenge with us. And we really need them. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, a, a sketch of how we think our factory will look like about 2425 and 2024, 2025. Uh, the top parts of this uh, building, I don't know if you can actually see my pointer, but uh, the, the, the highest uh, parts of the buildings is what we call our upstream uh, factory. So that is where we are making the precursor and cathode. So this is also what distinguishes is us from a lot of other battery producers that we do the precursor and cathode in-house. Uh, and then we have the battery production and these downstream facilities coming from, from the upstream part. So if we go to the next one, uh, this is how our factory looks today. Uh, so the upstream part uh, yeah. looks uh, very finished. This is for 16 gigawatt hours uh, upstream for 16 and then we have eight gigawatt hours downstream so eight by two we have built one and the second one is being uh, built at the moment uh, in total we think that this uh, first gigafactory will be about 40 gigawatt hours so that equals about 600,000 uh, cars on an annual basis uh, we will commission at the end of this year uh, so we are not uh, producing now from from this site we are only producing from our small site in Westeros uh, now I see another screen. Let me see if I can go back to my own. Uh, so we can take the next slide. Uh, so uh, I think this one is really interesting and this is really a challenge that, that we want to share with the, the, uh, the mining industry. If you look at this graph to the left one, uh, you can see the annual growth uh, annual growth of the battery industry. Uh, so it's a growth of about 30% per year. Uh, this means that 2030, uh, we have a need of 565 uh, gigawatt hours in Europe only. Northvolt wants to take uh, about 25% uh, of this share. So that equals 150 uh, gigawatt hours. Uh, so that means uh, three to four uh, of the factories that we are building now in Shleftu. Uh, as you can see to the left, uh, to the right, this is really driven by the automotive industry. Uh, they are the largest driver in this. Uh, I think when I listened to some presentations earlier today, what I think is really the challenge here is that we are growing in the speed of 30% per annum. Uh, this is not really uh, uh, the same speed 
as we see the ind other industries that we need in order to make this happen growing. Uh, so, I mean, when we discussed earlier the challenge in the, in the European industry with, with permits, with mining permits, uh, it cannot take that long as it does because to grow something 30% per annum will need so much more than, than what they are supplying. If we go to the next slide, uh, <clears throat> we want to produce the greenest battery. Uh, this is really our mission. Uh, we want to do this with the lowest carbon footprint. Uh, of course, by doing this, uh, we have lots of support from having a renewable energy uh, and the recycling uh, ambitions that we have. So if you go to the next slide, I think that is the one that is most uh, interesting for, for this uh, uh, for these five minutes I have on this presentation, on this day. Uh, if you look to the left, uh, you can see a reference battery. So uh, this is uh, how many kilos of CO2 emissions you have per kilowatt hour in a produced cell. So this reference was taken about two years ago. Uh, so two years ago, uh, of course, the batteries were produced only in Asia. So this is an Asian reference battery. Uh, what Northfield is doing to produce the greenest battery is, of course, localizing in a grid that is very green. Uh, by doing this, we can reduce the emissions by 50%. So if you look at this middle column here, middle bar, we, our emissions come a little bit from, from the grid, uh, even though it's still only hydro. Uh, <clears throat> but the majority of it, the absolute majority of our emission is coming from the raw materials we are using. So this is really where we need the mining industry to help us with solutions to improve this even further. So what we have done is adding on the recycling, uh, our own ambitions for the recycling target, uh, and of course selecting suppliers uh, who we think are doing a good job in, in this. Uh, and by this we can reduce the overall emissions down to something uh, around 75% lower than the Asian reference batteries. But still, even if we are here, I mean, you can still see that the raw materials, they bring on the, the largest part uh, of the carbon emissions in the battery cell. Uh, so that's why uh, it's so important to have these talks to, to see what we can really do in the European Union to, to reduce this even further. Uh, what we are doing um, in this is partly, of course, working with the right suppliers, selecting our suppliers, trying to motivate our suppliers to perform even better uh, when it comes to CO2. We are localizing some suppliers next to us uh, that today only produce their products in Asia. Uh, that will also help uh, quite a lot. Of course, we want to see more European projects. Uh, I mean, the sustainability in European PM projects is not only in the carbon uh, footprint, also in other areas, so of course. Um, but that, that is what we are doing. But this is also where we definitely need the mining industry to help us. And they will help us to bring the solution to, to come to these, uh, these good numbers for, for CO2. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you. And uh, please continue the discussion about Northvolt and uh, the very interesting uh, journey that you're on uh, in our chat window. Um, we need to jump over to the next speaker. The battery race is on all over the world at this point, and Finland is developing an electric vehicle battery value chain. We're happy to have Matti Hietanen, the CEO of Finnish Minerals Group here today, and he will explain why to invest here in the Nordics rather than in Central Europe. Here you go, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Emma, and uh, hopefully my presentation will also become visible to you. So uh, uh, perhaps someone can help with the, with the presentation. Okay, great. So um, I would firstly like to very briefly explain that uh, that, that what is uh, uh, Finnish Minerals Group. It might not be a familiar uh, company to you and then then uh, explain that what is what is the kind of like objective that we we have here and uh, uh, so we we are a government owned uh, holding and development company so that um, uh, currently we have uh, three mining assets in our portfolio we are the parent company of Terrafame that is the uh, 
um, large uh, nickel, zinc and cobalt uh, mine and, and provider and also starting a nickel and cobalt sulfate production soon. And, uh, and then now that Hanna just mentioned that uh, Northvolt uh, needs a uh, low CO2 footprint, I'm happy to, happy to uh, say that uh, Terraforma has the lowest CO2 footprint in the industry. So, so I think that, that that is obviously a good, good fit. Um, we are also the uh, largest owner in Caliber that was already uh, earlier mentioned here. So that is a lithium uh, project. And we also recently acquired uh, Sokli, which is a large scale uh, mining, mining uh, development project for, for uh, phosphate and uh, rare earth elements in, in northern, northern Finland. Uh, but on top of these mining assets, we, we actually uh, strive to go forward in the value chain so that now we have this, this kind of like a, a, uh, upstream covered here and uh, and then we we want to we want to go forward to this uh, uh, orange area so that the next step is is precursor and cathode active materials so we we actually a couple of weeks ago we announced uh, cooperation with the uh, chinese uh, gngr which is the largest uh, producer of uh, nmc and uh, nca cathodes uh, or precursors uh, in, in, in China and I, I assume even even globally currently. So we are we are preparing a precursor uh, investment uh, together with them in in Hamina, and uh, I'm sure that there will be also also uh, further uh, uh, announcements uh, on 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 this field uh, later on. Uh, um, so so the intention is to is to go to cathode uh, active materials uh, uh, fairly soon and then then eventually even even to sell production as well. Um, we we clearly see that uh, that that this this market environment that we are having here in Europe is extremely interesting. Um, I've been updating this this uh, slide uh, quite often, and basically every time that I that I show this, I, I think that uh, it is already outdated. So, for example, a couple of years ago, a couple of, a couple of days ago, when uh, Volkswagen came up with their uh, latest uh, announcements, I, I think that this this basically this uh, cell production and cell demand number number uh, uh, was was uh, uh, very very much uh, uh, increased uh, by those those announcements but uh, if we for example still use this 500 gigawatt hours of uh, cell cell demand and uh, and then cell production for for European uh, automotive industry at the end of this decade we we clearly can see that uh, there will be a Large need for for intermediates and uh, and and um, chemicals and raw materials and uh, this is obviously now becoming the the bottleneck for the for the European value chain, as as there basically isn't any cathode active material production for example currently yet. So obviously there are these these projects coming on, but uh, but but the the need will be quite significant and uh, and and. Uh, and uh, we, we obviously obviously uh, want to play our part here and help to help to offer these uh, sustainably produced materials for for European markets. But if I then try to summarize that uh, that that uh, what has been the market feedback that uh, that that uh, how, how how the market players see that how how uh, Nordic countries can can support the EU battery strategy and the the. Uh, facilitation of this, this uh, European battery value chain, I think that the, the, the first observation is that the uh, EU area will be one, uh, will be seen as a, as a one uh, large regional market. And, uh, and then that is obviously the, the, the whole idea of, of EU as a, as a, as a integrated market, market, but that is, that is really what, what, what is the situation here and how, 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 how it is seen. And also, uh, it is seen beneficial to have the whole value chain here in in uh, EU area. So not only the uh, uh, automotive industry, not only cell production, but also also uh, BCAM and CAM production, and uh, and then other other intermediates and uh, refining. Obviously, uh, there will be some some challenges or even quite uh, severe challenges with the, with raw materials because obviously uh, EU has a limited amount of of, of those. Um, it is also very, very uh, positive that there is very clear uh, political tailwind for both from EU, EU level and uh, from member states, uh, and that obviously uh, helps to attract uh, uh, both to attract uh, uh, foreign investments and also to take these uh, different uh, domestic um, projects uh, forward. 
so that is that is obviously well uh, very much uh, appreciated and uh, and and uh, big big advantage for for us thank you uh, very much uh we are a bit short of time and uh like uh, uh i said f after the last speaker uh please continue the discussion this very interesting topic in the chat window and uh, maybe you can jump in there too and, and continue the the discussion and your presentation in there because we need to carry on to the next speaker thank you very much mati thank you uh, metals we have talked a lot about metals today but metals aren't the only raw material needed for batteries graphite is a necessity for for lithium ion batteries serving as a base for the anode and talga uh, is developing a high quality graphite finding in northernmost Sweden. And Mark Thompson, the managing director of Talga Group, will give us an update now. Please, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. Good to see our friends again, if, uh, if uh, only afar at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it's no secret, of course, about the burgeoning interest in batteries and the incredible growth in plans to build more. Uh, as just mentioned in the introduction, what is not well understood is approximately half of the volume of the batteries are actually a material called graphite for anodes. That's the existing technology and the bulk far away, the largest part of uh, the anode solutions for most of the plant production. Um, but there's an issue. Um, this anode material uh, is undergoing great growth, but currently 100% of it is imported. Uh, right now, you have about 60,000 tonnes a year within Europe, and this needs to increase by 10 times over the next nine years. And that was before the, of course, very recent announcement by Volkswagen and Northvolt regarding their plans as well. Um, so there is a, a, a very clear um, dire need to have this material. So um, that's the business opportunity, shall we say. Um, and the requirement to make the Green Deal happen uh, with this um, shift into battery production within Europe. So if one was to propose what would make a good anode for lithium-ion batteries uh, that's made from graphite, there are three things to look out for. One is that it would be based on natural materials where the energy to graphitize the carbon has been done by mother nature. And so you have uh, savings on energy compared to coal and oil-based synthetic graphite, which is currently the case today. You would also be using hydropower or some other form of sustainable electricity, and it would be have a short supply chain. As we saw with COVID earlier on this year, the supply chains are extremely uh, limited in their capacity to deal with disruptions. And specifically for this material, the current supply chain is actually extremely dirty, I would say, when it comes to emissions. Currently, most of the material that's imported from Asia is synthetic, it contains approximately 90 times the CO2 emissions of what natural material would be produced in North Sweden. So overall, this is what Talga is doing. We are building a supply of anodes. We are actually producing the material that would be used directly by a battery company. We're producing it locally. We have plans to build an electric vehicle anode plant, which is under, getting underway now in Luleå in Sweden. And our plan would be to have a vertically integrated project where we mine uh, graphite from near Kiruna, concentrate it, and then purify and form the anodes um, near Lulia in Sweden. That is the existing plan. However, there are other aspects of Telga's work in, in the Nordics to make this even bigger in future, which is we're also a technology company. We have our own anode technologies, including silicon, and solid state uh, where we have anodes for those sorts of batteries so that as they grow with our customers, we do too. Um, it is public that uh, LKB uh, or Elkoabi and Mitsui from Japan have got LOIs or MOUs regarding potentially entering our project to help develop them. And we have a very good network of partners who are helping us make this greener future and we're interested in more. I would say though in, in the final uh, that it's actually at the moment faster to build a battery factory than it is to build the plant that makes the materials for the battery factory. I think now is a time when we've heard a lot today about leadership from the Arctic 
in the supply of materials and making this Green Deal happen. But I think, I think there has been a lot of words and it's time for more action, frankly. Uh, it is not a done deal. While the capital markets are hoping to put some funds towards these things, uh, frankly, it is a longer process to build these supply chains than it is, as I said, to build a battery factory. So we would now look to the same support that these large companies get uh, with battery factories and automotives that also has to apply to SMEs unless you want these supply chains to uh, not be built in time and continuously be relying on fully imported materials, which unfortunately is currently extremely um, high, high emission. And so to enable truly greener batteries, we must enable a greener supply chain. And the Arctic can certainly deliver that if we are given a fair playing field to in which to do so. And with that, I will pass it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that was excellent uh, last words that you uh, gave us. Thank you. We need to get the right prerequisites to, to be, uh, in order to develop. It's time to wrap this second session of this afternoon up. And we will do so, so together with our closing panel. And this time we have uh, one politician, one senior advisor, one industrial strategy executive and one senior vice president. So thank you. Now I can all see you. You're all on board. Welcome. And I'll start with the same question as I asked the previous panel on the first session we had. What is your, if you are to name one main takeaway from the previous speakers, what is that? Anyone? Oh, I just give I, the word. Okay, please. I can take the word and, and say that I'm uh, coming from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment. It's really heartwarming in these times that we see that investments are done and, uh, and the Nordic area is interesting for, uh, for new investment, new job opportunities. That is lovely. Okay. What do you say, Jakob Dalunde? Our politician, you have, I think you have muted. You are muted, sorry. Thank you so much. I think what we've heard today shows a lot of promise in that the Nordic region can play an important part in making sure that the European ecosystem for sustainable mobility can lead to both uh, more sustainable cities, lower climate impact and more prosperous uh, economy. I will be in charge for the Greens when negotiating the upcoming battery legislation. And one thing that I will focus on there is handling the question of recycling, which is crucial, because even we will, when we will expand um, the battery capacity and the EVs rolling out onto the market, we still have to acknowledge that there is environmental impact in the resourcing of these materials and the production of these batteries. And there's also a social impact in many of the countries where, there's, where these minerals are, are mined. So we need to emphasize and, and upscale the recycling and, and make sure that there's an ecosystem to handle that recycling. Yeah. Recycling is it's, uh, the uh, uh, topic, what we are focusing on on our third session. So please tune in at three o'clock and you will get a lot of recycling in your ears. And uh, again, uh, just to continue our tour here, uh, what uh, from Eparok we have Martin Jarpe, and uh, what is your main takeaway from the previous speakers? Yeah, so thank you. I think it's pretty clear in these discussions uh, is the scale of the transition that we are in the middle of and embarking on as well, right? And that scale has tremendous impact on the whole value chain, all the way from you know exploration and the reserves that are out there that are not fully sufficient, I think, to make this whole transition happen, all the way down to, you know, the whole value chain down to recycling to make sure that recycling can also add to the, the, the materials that we need there. And I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by that discussion that we hear here because people are, at least in these discussions, not underestimating that challenge and that change. Uh, and let's help bring that out outside also this uh, forum. Mm. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, and now to our fourth speaker, Bo Nordmark. Uh, what is your takeaway? You've been listening in as well. Well, uh, I would say one thing that we've heard there are a lot of opportunities actually in, in the Nordic region for developing minerals and also processed material. However, which we are going to talk about cell production here. 
I think the last uh, speaker nailed it quite well. It's much, much faster to build cell factories. And I will come back to that if you look at the uh, activity there. Uh, I, I think that um, people don't, I have not understood the time cr crunch to make these things happen. Thank you. I would like to continue on that, uh, the bottlenecks. Uh, you're a part of the European Battery Alliance. And uh, what would you uh, say are the, uh, or is the main uh, bottleneck to uh, the European battery value chain? I'm not sure if you, if you can uh, put up the slide that I submitted, but I can talk sure, about yes, it. We do have a slide that you provided us with. Could we have that uh, slide shown, please? Because in in 2016, when the battery alliance was kicked off, there was no battery, uh, lithium-ion battery production in Europe. And this is the current map where you can see there are 11 plants in operation or under construction. There are another 13 plants, uh, battery cell plants planned, or that was uh, until the day before yesterday when Volkswagen added four more. So now we have 17 plants. So altogether, we are talking about 28 cell plants in Europe. And when we analyze uh, this, uh, these plants could produce um, about, I mean, 350 gigawatt hours by 2025, and maybe up to the double amount in 2030. It's absolutely clear where the shortage is. It's in the raw materials and it's in the process material, it's in anode, it's in cathode, everything that is upstream is short. So the bottleneck is the raw materials in different forms, right? Absolutely, no, no, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Bo. Uh, I'll continue to um, uh, address uh, Martin Jarpe from Epiroc. You are one of the world leading manufacturers of underground equipment, and you are now leading the change towards sustainability in mining and uh, your battery uh, zero emission equipment. How important is this uh, Nordic battery cluster that we, we've been focusing on all afternoon for your leading position? Yeah. No, I mean, it's very important, right? We have a, a fantastic, you can call it sweet spot here in this region. We have, we have mines and we have reserves with the necessary uh, minerals. We have um, very, you know, ambitious sustainability agendas with several of our mining companies. Uh, we have battery production and innovation. Uh, we have uh, ours on our own side, we've had a partnership here with Northvolt for a couple of years, right? And we, we look at how can we transform our fleet to be fully available in battery electric um, uh, versions. Um, we have a sustainability target that by 2030, we're gonna have all our, um, um, all our equipment available in a battery version. And again, that would allow the mines to produce many of these minerals that are needed with a much smaller environmental footprint. And I think on top of that, we also have customers and uh, uh, consumers who are aware and exercise a pull and, uh, for, for these kind of greener uh, materials, which is also very good to help put pressure on us all, right? So I think overall, we, we are in a, in a sweet spot here uh, together as an industry to make this change happen. Uh, but as several of the previous speakers have, have mentioned, right, these are long-term um, timelines. So we really need to accelerate and push um, because if we if we are uh, just uh, leaning uh, back uh, things are not going to happen with the pace that we want uh i'd like to ask uh, jacob talunde uh from uh, the green party uh you heard uh, bo nordmark uh, identifying uh, the the main bottleneck for 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 the development right now in the battery industry is the ac access to to uh, raw materials um what can you do in your position to sort of get rid of that bottleneck? Well, it, it's an, a difficult challenge since the bottleneck partly is because of the very difficult conditions uh, that exist from a social perspective, from a democratic perspective, from an environmental perspective in many of the countries where we have to extract these precious uh, minerals. That is why I think we need uh, stricter criteria from the European perspective to make sure that uh, we have as high standards as possible, but well, we need also need to um, invest resources on the ground to ensure that we have due diligence and that we have better insights and a good structure to, to cooperate uh, between those companies who are extracting the minerals together with the intermediary companies and the end users and to make sure that the commission plays into this to, to, to manage the, uh, the trust 
and the transparency um, and the accessibility of, of these resources, resources so that we can expand the capacity of the production. But what can you do in your, your role as a politician? So in the upcoming legislation, we will do our best to make sure that we have strict criteria and, and demands for transparency so that consumers can be uh, uh, sure that when they buy batteries in the future, they will have as, as little environmental impact and social impact so that they can buy them with good conscience. Because I am wary that the entire sector might face a PR challenge when we are transitioning more to EVs. And at the same time, there might be horror stories in the press because of the conditions and the impact that consumers who want to buy cars with good conscience that they will not be able to do so. So that is really a risk. And we need to, to mitigate that risk to ensure uh, transparency and strict criteria on these minerals. Yeah, here I would just like to jump in and uh, uh, mention that in the third session, uh, starting at three o'clock, we will talk a lot about TraceMet, the uh, um, uh, labeling or sustainability system for mm -hmm. metals. So you'll find out more in, in, a, in a while on that about that. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob Dalunde. Uh, jumping over to, to Finland, to Rika Altonen. Uh, what do you do? You agree with uh, Jakob Dalunde? Uh, yes, I do actually, because cus customers can change the the um, attitude, and and by their demand, uh, there there will be better procedures. But also, they have to be able to trust. That, that the product, it, when they want to do a, a good deed for environment and, and buy, for example, an expensive car, they have to be able to trust that it really is a good deed. So I think it's very important that the European Union sets the scene and, and discusses and have, have raised the issue of raw materials and security of supply and also the sustainability issues. And, uh, and with this, it raises awareness even in member states and, and among the public in general. Every, everyone knows quite a lot nowadays about batteries, electric vehicles and, and all, all that stuff, because it is so much written and discussed. And for example, as our minister mentioned here earlier, our national battery strategy from this January uh, very well responds uh, and is in line with European Union initiatives and objectives. And of course, the, the battery battery regulation will play a, a, a crucial role. And, and then, of course, there are more strategies coming on regional level. Uh, but I think the problem probably which has been pointed out here earlier also uh, is that, or, or maybe the issue is that there are so many different strategies, governmental reports, and this is not only on national, but also European Union level. And, and there is the question of coherence, because there are so many different actions concerning climate, environment, green deal, sustainability, economic recovery, digitalization, the list is long. And they all are bits and pieces. They, they have the connection, for example, to this uh, raw materials question, primary as well as secondary. And those bits and pieces must fit in the big puzzle of enabling the prosperous life, not only for us, but also for future generation. And those bits must fit together to build a solid result. If they don't fit, then we end up in these kind of collisions between different um, uh, aspects. Yeah, and I think that's a, uh, a question for our politicians to make sure that it's a policy coherence. We do have time for some like very last, uh, like some final words from all of you. Uh, Bo Nordmark, what do you want to add to the discussion and what do you want to bring forward short? short? Uh, I would like to bring forward, it's interesting when we start talking EVs, that's when we talk, start talking about sustainable batteries. We already have a lot of batteries, but now the discussion is here, which is good. Secondly, it's no uh, excuse to export uh, the hassle we're with extracting minerals uh, to other countries. We have to do it in Europe as well. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Bo Nordmark. Uh, we jump over to Epirock. Martin Jarpe, please. 
Yeah, so maybe add one perspective that we didn't talk about. I mean, the scale of the transition is tremendous, right? But what, what I think is important for players like us as well is to, to help, uh, you know, our customers to also take small steps that lead towards uh, the, the end game here. Uh, so for us, you know, retrofit solutions where you can take an old diesel machine and actually replace the diesel engine with a battery solution, um, battery as a service, uh, second life uh, services and solutions for batteries, etc. Those things help making this more of a transition rather than saying you have to have take as a mining company the huge plunge and replacing everything at once. Uh, I think we will get a faster uh, uh, path here if we also work both with the small and with the really big uh, at the same time. Thank you, Martin. And over to Rika, uh, please. Uh, I must say that I I, I am I, I I have the same opinion as uh, as uh, Martin here earlier. Uh, that was a very good point that we have to also prolong the the life of products. That is exactly what you were mentioning, and that is an important bit in this puzzle. Thank, thank you, Rika Altonen. Um, and lastly, going to uh, to uh, uh, Jakob Talunde from the Green Party. I think a final thing to mention is that we as legislators also need to be mindful about protecting uh, intellectual property because um, in the old era, the, the main thing that the car company knows is the drivetrain, the internal combustion engine. But in the future, the main thing will be the battery technology and how to manage it, the battery management system. And we need to make sure that when we're handling recycling, that we do this in a, in a way that enables companies to prosper in the way that they handle batteries. That's right. We need to be uh, mind mindful and mindful. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, words from our panel. Thank you very much, speakers, uh, during the these previous speakers, and uh, thank you all participants. And um, the next session is on recycling. That's our last. That's where we're closing the loop, so to speak, and it will start in a few minutes at three o'clock sharp. So see you soon.
Welcome back to the third session of this webinar this afternoon. We are explaining how the European Arctic can secure the European Green Deal. My name is still Emma Hadmark and I still work at SVEM in the Swedish Mining Association. And it's my pleasure to walk you through this third session of today. We will focus on recycling this when we're, where we're closing the loop, so to speak. And our first speaker is the CEO of Finland, Pekka Suomela. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, hey, Kaikille ja terveisiä Helsingistä. Dear friends, hello from uh, Helsinki. My name is Pekka Suomela, and I'm uh, the CEO of Finnish Mining Association, Finmi. Welcome to this third uh, part of, of our webinar, how Finland and Sweden secure the European Green Deal with sustainable uh, raw materials and batteries. Our session is about uh, recycling, as Emma mentioned. The global scene is, of course, uh, the circular economy. Our keynote speaker is Mr. Ibrahim Bailan, Minister for uh, Business, Industry and Innovation from Sweden. After him, uh, we will hear some hotspots around uh, different projects and some uh, company presentations as well. Then uh, there will be a panel uh, which will be moderated by Emma. She is the hardworking mining lady of this afternoon. The European uh, mining operations, mining technology providers and uh, metal producers have made circular economy one of its top priorities. Working to reduce and reuse secondary materials, transforming waste into resources, improving both the efficiency of raw materials uses and the recyclability of products made from uh, primary minerals and metals. Sustainable processes and products will also uh, continue to be a fundamental driver for the sector, improving our performance with regard to energy, water management and material efficiency. Sustainable mining practices and the fact that metals are 100% recyclable, this also adds uh, the value and importance of metals and minerals, making mining an essential part of Green Deal. Dear all, let's give the floor to His Excellency Minister Ibrahim Bailan. Emma, over to you. Thank you very much, Pekka Suomela. Uh, my, my friends here, the production team in the studio here in Stockholm uh, said I, I uh, introduced to us the CEO of Finland. Uh, just to set things clear, you are the CEO of Finmin. And uh, maybe I was stressed uh, from, from seeing that hockey game seems to be going on on your desk. Anyway, thank you, Pekka. Uh, last week, our next speaker appointed a much awaited government investigation on the Swedish Minerals Act. Here is a pre recorded address from, like Pekka mentioned, the Swedish Minister of Business, Industry and Innovation, Ibrahim Bailan. Dear participants, dear friends, let me begin by expressing my gratitude for the opportunity to introduce Sweden's take on raw materials demand and management. This is times when uh, minerals and metals have been identified as key for the transformation for a low carbon society. The sustainable production and use of raw materials is a major challenge, but it's also a key factor to ensure the needed transformation towards a green and circular economy. We all know that minerals and metals, they are essential to the functioning and integrity of a wide range of industrial ecosystems. Today, we acknowledge that many so-called critical mineral uh, raw materials have shown to be irreplaceable components of numerous emerging technologies and also essential industrial developments especially renewable energy systems, electric vehicles, 
rechargeable batteries, consumer electronics, telecommunication, robotics, and specialty alloys. Hence, access to mineral resources and sustainability is key for the European Union's resilience. As if this challenge was not enough, the COVID-19 crisis has also revealed just how fast and how deeply global supply chains can be affected and disrupted. As an EU member state who aims to take the lead in the green transition, we are of course dedicated to contribute to EU's resilience and safe raw material supply. We see important initiatives in the northern parts of Sweden that are driving tra the transition. The hybrid fossil free steel, LKAB's future strategy, Northvolt in Skellefteå, among others. We have also, the government, uh, appointed a coordinator for business investments and expansions in, nor uh, north and, uh, in the north of, of Sweden, in Norrk Westerbotten. The transition to a climate neutral society is dependent on increased access to metals and minerals. Things like solar panels, windmills, electric vehicles, batteries, satellites, mobile telephones, all of these things contains metals and minerals. Together with the other Nordic countries, we are taking the lead in establishing global standards and certification for responsibly produced metals and minerals. We see the United Nations Framework Classification for Resources, the UNFC, as a useful tool for further work with resource management. The UNFC can help countries to optimize a sustainable use of primary as well as secondary raw materials. Why we welcome that the Nordic guidance document has been to help to spread and implement the UNFC. We all know that there are a lot of challenges and a lot of interests when it comes to utilizing our resources. Therefore, last summer Sweden started a review for a more modern and efficient environmental permit and last week I had the opportunity and the pleasure to present that Sweden will start a review of our mineral regulatory framework surrounding exploration and mining activities for a more sustainable supply of critical raw materials. At the same time, we need investments and business models for a more circular economy and to increase secondary recovery. Sweden is one of the world's most innovative countries. The climate transition lays the foundation for new solutions and export opportunities. It strengthens our competitiveness and creates tomorrow's jobs and prosperity. Good luck with the, with, the, with the seminar and I hope we have a productive day. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim Bailan, the Minister of Enterprise. The uh, investigation or the review uh, that he was mentioning, the review of the Minerals Act, uh, the instruction just became public uh, the other day. So. We are at the moment at Svemin, the mining organization, uh, reading thoroughly through the instructions and uh, we will comment on them shortly. Before we continue with our next speaker, I would like to uh, again encourage you to share your thoughts about what's being discussed here uh, during the presentations and small talks in between. Please do, do so in the chat window uh, next to, to the screen not next to the screen, next to the, <laughs> to the broadcast. Uh, we also encourage you to uh, uh, go uh, uh, on Twitter and other social media and talk about this event. Use the hashtag EU Industry Week. So hashtag EU Industry Week. The sustainability awareness in the world is increasing and recycling is one parameter. And being transparent about the original materials in our products is another. Without doubt, there is a growing need to provide traceability systems throughout value chains. But for recyclable metals, it is a little bit more tricky than just put an echo label on a banana, for example. A banana is consumed only once. Therefore, 
Swimming has developed a brand new system or a pilot system, I should stress, for traceability of metals. And this pilot system is called TraceMet. And uh, it sounds like a coincidence, but tomorrow at this time, we, have a, uh, we will be launching the TraceMet report with a seminar. So uh, please tune in tomorrow and you will find the, uh, it, the registration is still open and that's also my colleague just posted the link to the registration in the chat window. So please register and you will find out all the details about TraceMet, the pilot system TraceMet uh, tomorrow afternoon. But now we will get a sneak peek on this, our findings. So uh, Erik Lindblom, the project manager of TraceMet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm quite glad to get this opportunity to present TraceMet, which is uh, both a, a project and, and uh, as Emma has said, a brand new pilot system for tracing uh, sustainable metals and minerals. And uh, starting with the, a few words on, on the project, it was carried out at a high pace during last year. And the project was initiated by Sviamin, uh, the Swedish Association of Mines, Mineral and Metal Producers, and it was financed by the Swedish Mining Innovation a Strategic, the Strategic uh, Innovation Program for uh, Swedish Mining and Metal Industry. And as for the system, uh, with this TraceMet system, we have uh, been able to show that environmental performance can be traced from mine to manufacturer. And as Emma said, uh, we are convinced that this is important uh, as a tool to balance the increasing global demand for metals and minerals uh, with a critical, critical need for sustainable supply chains to address the ongoing climate and biodiversity crisis. And we also think that traceability will give uh, proactive and responsible actors a uh, competitive advantage. The TraceMet system covers two environmental parameters. It's carbon footprint and uh, the content of recycled metals. And these parameters were, uh, they were selected as being both environmentally relevant and interesting from a system development perspective, uh, since they are both uh, strongly linking the different actors in the value chains uh, together. And we were very fortunate uh, to have a project group that covers the value chains of both steel and copper. And, and uh, this turned out to be absolutely critical for our success since a um, multi-actor cross value chain perspective uh, turned out to be um, imperative for identifying and also exploring and solving the challenges along the way. So we have a very strong TraceMet team. Uh, the steel chain is represented by LKAB, SSAB and Scania and Volvo. And the copper chain by Boliden, Elektrokoppar and ABB. The project was chaired by Sviamin and the system de development was done by experts from IBL and RICE in cooperation. And TraceMet is structured to meet the necessary conditions for a reliable, functional and a distributed system. And the first requirement is cooperation. And since the chain is only as strong as the weakest link and if there the actors along the value chains aren't cooperating, uh, they won't be sharing the necessary data and there will be no traceability. And we achieved uh, this uh, through a um, high degree of both lateral and vertical integration of the project group and um, making it possible to utilize the, the combined knowledge range, so to say, from of the entire project group and through uh, applying a agile development process. The second requirement is an administrative system stating how to calculate and report the environmental performance of the metals 
And this is done in a way that makes it uh, through certified claims that can be verified by an independent third party. And Tracement has utilized and adapted uh, existing standards to achieve this quick and uh, reliable. The third requirement is the technical system uh, responsible for, for storing the data, being the vehicle, so to say, for the data. And uh, it should ensure both uh, availability and integrity of data. And Tracement is using a blockchain technology and in this way making uh, the database available only to the users, making the database encrypted and distributed. And finally, as I've been trying to stress, uh, there must be trust. There must be internal trust um, to be able to develop the system. And in a possible next or future step, uh, there must also be external trust uh, for more users to join the tracement system and um, to make it attractive to the market. And I would like to tell you a lot more about tracement and I will get the opportunity to do so, as Emma said, tomorrow. I hope to see you then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erik Lindblom. And uh, like you said, we will be uh, getting a lot more details about the TraceMet pilot system tomorrow. And that interesting finding that trust is just could be just as difficult to gain as uh, the technological knowledge. But I'm happy to I can reveal that you actually you did manage with both. So tune in tomorrow at one o'clock to find out more. The mining industry, sure, is a huge producer of waste material. But what is waste and what is a hidden asset? That is not set in stone, as we say in the mining industry. At the moment, LKB is digging deep into their waste heaps and they are finding some real valuable resources in there. We're happy to have Ulrika Håkansson here. She is the project manager of a remap that Jan Moström mentioned when he held his presentation a few hours ago. So Ulrike Håkansson, the digital floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can see my presentation, I hope. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, so as you've heard this morning from uh, our CEO at LKB, we will transform our, our company to a carbon dioxide free company and we also would like to add on a, a resource uh, making sure that we use all the resources that we actually have taken out of the earth crust and that's where this project comes in to extract critical minerals from our mine waste just to get a kind of the sense of the volumes that we can create with the scope of this project it corresponds to about 30 percent of the european union's need of rare earth elements per year and about five times the Swedish need of uh, cadmium free and the phosphorus type of mineral fertilizers for, uh, for Sweden. So we can add a really good uh, volume to, to the European market and reducing the dependency of imports to the European Union. And the, also both the rare earth elements and the phosphorus is classified as critical minerals in the European Union. So we can, we also make sure that 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 one falls into place. So our plan is uh, to uh, process the fresh tailings. So we're taking what's coming out of the beneficiation plants, both from uh, Malmberget and Kiruna. Uh, what we're looking for is the appetite of the mineral appetite that contains both the phosphorus and the REs today. We uh, by flotation process, we, um, we do that to a concentrated form that we can transport by train to an industrial park. In the industrial park, we further down the value chain create the final products to, to the final market. Our product goals are for uh, the, the main product is to fertilize the phosphorus fertilizer, and that's for the agriculture industry, of course. Uh, the second one is the RE as a concentrate, and that's for the clean tech industry. And that needs further, of course, separation uh, uh, within the e European Union to make sure that it's, it stays within the European Union borders. And finally, it's a commercial 
gypsum product uh, for the civil engineering industry, for the uh, construction industry and so forth. We have had a, the really product goal to make sure that we don't create new deposits out of this deposits that we're using. Uh, we also plan to use green energy and uh, hydrogen to make sure that we get a fossil free industrial park. And we also add to, uh, uh, to produce our own feed materials, green ammonia to make sure that the carbon footprint gets as low as po possible and the sulfuric acid for a cost control reason and for some additional reasons. We are in a uh, pre-feasibility phase right now and we'll stay there for the rest of this year. Uh, we are focusing mainly, of course, of the new technologies that we need for to make sure that we get the products goals that we are aiming for. Uh, we uh, estimate that we can have an industrial uh, production in, uh, in place by 2027. Uh, there are, of course, some uh, dependencies. We need a good location, a suitable location for the industrial park. There's some uh, environmental permits. It's three of them. It's both from Malmeriet and Kiruna, where we have the appetite plants and for the industrial park. Uh, so both in timing and in, in uh, and to make sure that we get, get a good, good plan, implementation plan together. We need enough electricity to go fossil free and, and uh, lower the carbon footprint, uh, we need a lot of electricity and we have to make sure that we get that in place as well. All this together has to go come into place as a financially good uh, business case. And uh, we don't know yet what type of market premiums we can get for these products. I mean, it's a, it's a fossil free, it's a circular from recycled waste material it's locally produced, it's out of cadmium for the uh, phosphorus, uh, and it's a good, good quality and high grade product. But we don't know yet what uh, premiums we can get. So, so that's further on to explore as well. And uh, we, uh, you can learn more about the project on the website. So we have remap.com where we publish progress of the project. Uh, when something new pops up. So please look in there and contact us if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrika Håkansson from LKB. Uh, I was just curious, uh, maybe, you, maybe you mentioned in your presentation, uh, but mm -hmm. when, when, will the, when will you uh, sort of introduce your recycled products uh, to the market? 2027. 2027. Okay. It could be earlier, but it, it on a timeline scale, it's a bit uh, on the uh, permit. We ha have to make sure we get the permits in place. Yeah, because that's my, my sort of next question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that the main bottleneck for for to to secure the possibility to to access this vast uh, uh, resource? Yeah, for, from a planning and an implementation strategy, that's that's the bottleneck. But of course, I would like to say it's the technology and make sure that we get the, the right um, products out there. But the, 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 the permits are there. They're, they're a challenge for us. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. we do keep our fingers crossed this new, uh, yes. the review of the Minerals Act and, and all the other governmental investigations going on will sort of uh, ease the uh, burden of uh, permitting processes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ulrika Håkansson. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will continue with uh, another company example. We will jump over to the Finnish side. Autokompo uh, has the biggest, their biggest integrated plant in Tornio, boasts a comprehensive production chain, and it starts with chrome from their own Kemi mine. So Marti Sassi is the president of Ferrochrome, and he will give us an update. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will give you a short presentation of, of Autocompo Tornia and, and uh, how we are doing recycling here, here in, in North Finland. Uh, uh, our location, our location here, here in, in North Finland, we are very close to Swedish border, as, as you know. 
we have in Kemi only European chromite mine where the raw materials are feed to our tornio mill. Uh, altogether, we are producing roughly 3% of the global production of ferrochrome in Tornio and, and uh, also roughly 3% of the global stainless steel melt production here in, in Tornio. Uh, our site is, is viewed, viewed here. Uh, altogether, it is uh, roughly uh, six square kilometers this, this plant area and and we have own harbor which is open through the year and and it's it's important way for our, our imported raw materials and and exported products uh, we are probably the most integrated ferrochrome and and stainless steel production unit globally and, and uh, of course, this has clear benefit, integration benefits, for instance, for transportation, for, for energy savings, etc. Steel itself, stainless steel and, and of course, mild steel, it is 100% recyclable product. And also, it is the most recycled material in the, in the world. Uh, when we produce stainless steel, depending on, on, on the customer applications to which, which purpose these are finally delivered, the lifetime of the product varies roughly between 10 years to 100 years. Of course, uh, goods like, like white goods and uh, other, other appliances at, at home most probably has the shortest lifetime. But uh, when we think about the bridges or buildings, these, these are built for lasting hundreds of years even. Uh, when the material is end of the lifetime, it is returned back to our melting and, and uh, once again, we are producing stainless steel, which is the raw material for new ap applications. And uh, this circle is, is rounding year after year. Uh, recycling is also an important driver for CO2 emission reductions. There on the left hand side, you can see Autocompos uh, CO2 emission by, by scope, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Also, transport uh, emissions are, are also included for these. And from this green bars, you can see that, that uh, we have reduced in, in recent years significantly uh, the scope three emissions. And, and the main reason for that is, is seen there on the right hand side, where is the share of the recycled material in our, our melt shop. Year after year, we have been able to increase this, and this has led to this, this positive development also in, in, in CO2 emissions in, in our, our production and, and the value chain. It's, it's not only uh, steel products what are re recycled. Uh, this, these byproducts are, are important part of this, this story as well. Uh, as you know, there is no metal products without the slags, and, and these slags are, uh, slag formers are, are really needed to produce all kinds of metals. It's valid also for stainless steel, it is valid for, in our case also for, for ferrochrome. Our, all our slags are currently CE marked products, not, not waste, these are products, and these are used instead of virgin materials, Instead, like, like there in, in, in this lower picture, you can see for road construction, all kinds of civil constructions. And this has also important role in, in CO2 emission reductions when we look at this more, more globally. Uh, last but not, not least at, at all, uh, we have to look all our, our side streams. Uh, here is a, a small 
case study, we have uh, had very close collaboration with Finnish company Crisoltec OY, which is currently a part of, of Finnish Fortum Group. Uh, earlier in the, in the past, uh, uh, pickling acid residues, which are, uh, I would say, sulfate containing sludges, these were neutralized and, and landfilled after that. This, uh, this uh, Crisalta company developed a pro process where they are able to produce from this, this large various products like, like magnesium sulfate, nickel sulfate, and, and also iron chromium, sorry, iron, iron chromium filter cake. And, and these are recycled back to use so that uh, find that these products are used in, in pulp bleaching, fertilizer, and, and also currently these, these nickel sulfates in, in battery chemicals. Thank you, everybody. It, it was my pleasure to present this, this short story here from Autokum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matti. Uh... Sassi of uh, Autocompo for this information. We will jump back over the uh, Botnia again, over to uh, the Swedish side, over to where we find Bolid and Rönnskär, a massive smelter outside of Skellefteå. It's in fact the world leader in electronics recycling. And today we have Karin Anquist. She's corporate responsibility manager, and she will explain the latest from the world of recycling of electronics. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I hope I unmuted everything so that you can see. Um, I'm up here in Rönnsjö, as you can see. Uh, I'm representing Boliding as a company. We are both a miners and a smelters company. Um, and I will head into the complexity of being both a, a mines and a smelters company. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present here today. I'm going to try to shift to a new picture. Yes, uh, I just want to take things back to some of the things that we mentioned on the pre uh, parts of the of the day, because this is what it's all about. We've been talking during the day about batteries and we've been talking about the going fossil free and, and the transition that makes. And we often talked about the the rare materials and the rare minerals, but we also have to emphasize on the fact that we need vast and big uh, opportunities on base metals as well. Uh, Bolid and, and, and Rönnsjö as a smelter is a big provider of copper and producing that we are also producing a lot of other byproducts products as they also mentioned. Uh, but we also need to emphasize on the fact that base metals such as copper are in huge demand already and will be even increasing with electrification and all that comes with that. Uh, we can sort of grasp the, the numbers with, with comparing a, an electric car towards an, an old ingestion car and, and a, a new car, an electric car, demands four times the amount of copper as the old cars. Uh, and the shift that's now going in transport, the shift that's going on in our society, demands space metals in a way that we're not used to in any way. And as mentioned before, as in the speakers, by the speakers, we are not uh, sort of really supplying the, the shift in that sense. Uh, Rönnsjö is already a big recycler. We talked about uh, the interesting remap projects and so forth. Uh, we've been a big uh, recycler from the 70s and on. We are a complex um, smelter. Uh, treating a lot of, of different raw materials, and I will come back to that. But today we are one of the biggest world leading in electric, electric waste. Uh, that's what we usually call e-scrap. So every day we are melting 2 million mobile phones in our facilities. And so that sort of gives you the also the touch and feel on how 
huge the recycling scale is and you also have to remember that this is also a very global material market uh, so when you think think about the recycling loops and then and how to treat and and uh, make the opportunities for recycling you ha also have to uh, keep in mind that it is a global um, material stream we are also big recycling facility uh, for waste from other uh, industries and other production lines, such as steel. Uh, the steelwork dust is, is one of the big parts that comes in, and also the zinc ashes and incineration from, from heating and all, all the other things. So we take care of all of these materials coming in, which is about 20% of the materials that we treat, uh, but it's also a very complex material. Um, we have to keep that in mind uh, when we talk about recycling, that the materials that comes in isn't copper coming in and copper going out. It's a very complex uh, material coming in, so we need to treat it uh, in many ways uh, and with high skill. So our business model is uh, is always developing, and, and as Autocompo Memati uh, told, we always emphasize on how are we able to use all the materials? How can we productify? How can you, we make the mining materials and the, and the circulated materials, the, the secondary materials, stay in the loop? How can we make a product that the, that the world needs and use? Uh, and we also need to emphasize on that because of the balance of the, all the energy that we need to use to get these materials out for the world to use. Uh, so as I mentioned, 20% roughly of our materials that we uh, that we treat in our plant is recycled. Uh, most of the other is the mining materials, but both the mining materials and the recycled material today contains less and less uh, metals. So we always have to balance with the energy going in, uh, the metals coming out. So we are now emphasizing a lot of, of our uh, uh, development in how to also go totally fossil free. We are already a huge uh, user of uh, electricity related to the furnishing process, but we uh, use uh, for the reduction how to actually get the metals out of the material. We use a lot of, of fossil uh, coal today. That is sort of the common way to use it. Uh, so now we are emphasizing a lot of, of our energy on finding new ways of, of keeping production up, but doing it in a fossil free way, how to reduce and, and have the reduction process in a fossil free way. So we are uh, moving forward with a project that we call Resico, which, which is a reduction process. And we are probably needing to go through the techniques that are already here with, with the possibility with bio, uh, bio coal or bio oil, for, for instance, and also then going into uh, other more further on uh, techniques such as uh, hydro or so on. We also in that uh, situation also need to mention with reducing this vast uh, grasp of material and having the situation where we have complex materials, we always need also to focus on how to reduce the CO2 of the materials that are coming in. So we are also now looking at the CCS technique together with other parts of the industry. So I stopped there. Perfect. I was just about to interrupt you. Uh, it's very interesting and thank you. That's some impressive figures that you were presenting about the... Uh, I actually took a screenshot here. The electrical waste uh, equivalent to 2 million mobile phones per day that you're handling. It's amazing. Yeah. So we can't keep that loop in Vesterbotten because we don't have enough mobile phones to turn around. So we need to keep it very global. The material streams are very global in this sense. Thank you very much, Karin Ankvist from Boliden Rönnskär. Thank you. Thank you. Now, for us here in Stockholm, it's time to summarize this third session. And we will do so together with our closing panel. This time we have uh, two politicians, one assistant professor and one public affairs manager. Welcome.
Do we have everyone on board? I can only see three persons. Now, all four of you here. Okay, welcome every one of you. I would like to start by asking you, what is your main takeaway from all these interesting discussions that we have had? Any well, one of you? I could start with I'm Mari Lundström from Aalto University. Yep. And I think what clearly came up from this discussion is that recycling and recycling is very different. We have raw materials like stainless steel from the older times that is quite straightforward and efficient to recycle. And then we have these modern products, wealthware products of, of highly multi-metal, multi-material composition, and they are challenging. And, and there it's high to reach such high recycling rate by, by volume or by weight compared to the uh, traditional products. So our wealthware, the products are designed for high performance, but not always for high recycling rates. Thank you very much, Marie, Marie Lundström at Alto University. What do we say? Uh, we have uh, Elsie Katainen from the EU Parliament. What is yes. your takeaway? Yes, thank you. My main takeaway from the previous speakers is that uh, Finland and Sweden have every possibility to become leaders in, in battery production and recycling in Europe. But, but we have to be uh, vocal in the EU decision tables and make, uh, make uh, noise to ensure um, that sustainable circular economy and bioeconomy gets stronger way in the European Green Deal. Um, that EU regulation gives also incentive to foreigners. Thank you very much, Elsie. Uh, we continue to our, our other politician, Erik Bergqvist of Svenska Swedish Socialdemokraterna, the Swedish Social Democratic Party. Yeah, that was kind of Swinglish of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, my, I would say my main takeaway is that development is going really, really, really fast in a positive direction right now. And that, I would say, we are looking much more at the, the whole perspective from mining to to metal, to product, and then to a recycled metal. So, so in, a, in a positive way, things are happening very, very fast now. So that's yeah. my main takeaway. Yeah, innovation and development is, is going really fast. But now over to our, the last, uh, but not least, uh, uh, panelist, uh, Janne Koivisto of the Public Affairs Manager at Fortum. Uh, what is your takeaway listening during this last session? Yeah, I guess I could pretty much second what MEP Katainen, Katainen already said that the market is developing very fast and we, we need to be awake, awake here in the Nordics, also within, within the companies, but, but on, on a political decision making as well. So, so we, we need to secure that the decision, take, decision taken in, on, on, on EU level and also on national level will support the sustainable battery value chain in the future. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will go back to, to our assistant professor, Marie Lundström at the Alto University. You are developing methods, I understand, and processes designed to more effectively recover and re recycle metals. And that's uh, amazing how we've been talking about how we get more of these efficient, all these processes. And I guess everybody uh, across the world wants to increase this the effectiveness. I guess one of this, the challenges is that these me metals that we need and we want we, that we want to recycle uh, exist in very small quantities in, for example, a, a cell phone. Uh, what other challenges are there uh, for in this, the main obstacles for, for making this work uh, more efficient? Well, I think technically the obstacle is that we need to guarantee that we don't spend more energy or, or raw materials for recovering the minor elements than what we are uh, uh, compared to virgin raw materials. So everything is technologically possible. We can recover whatever elements from there, but we need to make innovations and, and technical solutions. And I think that's one of the Nordic competitive edge that we are quite good in, in uh, research and development there that we make such innovations that truly are environmentally sustainable when we recover more. And then in a bigger scale, of course, in the development of materials and products, we should always have a line 
uh, the evaluation of the recyclability when we develop any products that contain metals or other materials that we would not develop or invest a lot on our research money, for example, on such battery types that would not be recyclable for, for future generations. Yeah, uh, should it be more regulated? I mean, um, al already on the, um, um, when, when you design a product that like, for example, a cell phone, should it be designed to be uh, recycled? Uh, should I, it would be say even, I would say even earlier, when you make research, when we invest national or, or EU funding, we should always require that already in the first initial states of the innovations, when we investigate the probable for good performance, we would investigate and require investigation of the recyclability. Should, um, from the political side, our two politicians, do you agree? Should it be more regulated? Should it be forced upon the producers and the designers? Well, uh, we are already doing that. Uh, for example, when we from the parliament are saying that the mobile phones and such devices, they should be more durable and they should be possible to, to update. And I would say that's a regulation in this. But we have to do it when it's possible or when we think that a push in the right direction will make it make it possible but still don't make it too detailed because the development is going so fast so we have to do things that encourage but don't in a way hamper or or stop these things from developing mm. but i'm sure there will be more regulation and i think one important regulation that we are looking at right now is of course the the the, the cabam the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism when we know a lot of electronics take a lot of carbon when they are produced and how can we see too that we make this adjustment mechanism so efficient that it will decrease the number of uh, of carbon emissions and of course also increase the the recycling and when we import when for example when we import a lot of garbage phones for the smelter in Russia how do we put the the the, the, the mechanism to use so it makes it easier to import these to a really efficient uh, industry as the, the rancher smelter, for example. Mm. So. Elsie Katainen, our Finnish politician here today, uh, do you agree with Erik Bergqvist? Yes, I really do. I really do agree with with him and I actually have no, no uh, more to say about this. It is also a um, question of how consumers see, see these things and how good awareness do they have about, for example, uh, how the cobalt, where, where is coming from? Is it coming from uh, Congo or from Sotkamo, Finland? Mm. So this is very, very important mm. things. What do you see, Elsi Katainen, what do you see is the most urgent uh, that you can do in your political role? Uh, to uh, facilitate recycling of metals in order to fulfill the Green Deal? Um, um, I do believe Finland and Sweden in the front line of the recycling and sustainable battery production uh, because we have the know-how and expertise on recycling, but also a sustainable mining sector uh, with all the critical minerals from cobalt and, and lithium. The EU Commission has proposed ambitious recycling targets in the battery regulation, and for the first time we are actually regulating the whole life cycle of the battery, not just the end states. So I think uh, EU has a very good chance to become a world leader on sustainable battery production in the circular economy. Thank you. I will jump over to, uh, to uh, Fortum and Janne Koivisto. You're expanding your uh, EV battery re recycling operations with a new mechanical processing plant in Finland. What, what is the unique selling point of your new recycling operations, so to speak. Yeah, Th thanks for the question. Uh, I would say that 
the unique selling point would be that we have chosen a, a non-thermal low CO2 approach in our, in our whole battery recycling, not just in, in the new Ecolinen plant. In, in the new, new investment in Ecolinen, we are uh, using mechanical processing and uh, instead, instead of smelting used by some, some operators, uh, this, this process produces higher recycling rates and, and lower CO2 emissions. Uh, and and fr from the Ecolin plant, we are uh, sending, sending the processed mineral components uh, from, from the mechanical process to, to our NATO processing facility in, in Harjavalta for hydrometallurgical process, again, a low CO2 process. And where we where we create new new chemicals, new recycled raw materials for battery products. Uh, and thirdly, what I'd like to mention is that as a company, decades of experience in in waste waste management, waste recycling, and hazardous waste business, we got the whole waste value chain covered. Uh, whether there are hazardous or non-hazardous waste streams in the process, other than those most most valuable active materials, which everybody's looking after, such as other metals or plastics, we can either recycle them or recover to energy in our own facilities in Finland. Uh, what do you say, our uh, assistant professor Marie Lundström? Uh, how how is Fortum doing? Well, I think Fortum is going to the right direction, for example, regarding to uh, lithium recovery, that uh, earlier lithium has not been globally recovered much. And of course, like, like uh, 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 the politicians mentioned, so now EU will require lithium recovery up to at least 70 percent. And, and Fortum has taken also this, this guideline, actually before this guideline was set, to address issue of non-recovered elements, to recover more of the of the elements that have not been traditionally recovered, but there's still a lot to do, and I think Europe can be in the front line in making innovations for aluminium recovery, manganese recovery, electrolyte recovery, fluoride recovery of, of such components that have not been commonly recovered. So we have still a lot to do. Yes, we sure have. And I will let that be the last words of this panel discussion. We have many slots, but they are all short, as you've noticed by now. So thank you very much for your time and your uh, wise insights that you gave us. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker today is the director of North Sweden European office. And he will now try to summarize three hours webinar in three minutes. So please, all everybody, listen up and listen to uh, Mikael Jansson. Thank you. Uh, I have the honor to deliver the final remarks. And uh, as Emma said, it's to do with three minutes for three hours packed uh, hours, which is, of course, not possible. I will instead take my starting point from a phrase that we use at the EU office for Northern Sweden, uh, that we are on top of Europe and to be in the core of the EU. We, together with Northern Finland in the EU's own Arctic, are on top of Europe with needed resources and assets for the EU. We are also on top as front runners in many areas, not least what we have discussed today. This afternoon has shown our regions and stakeholders engagement. It has shown the ongoing enormous investments to make the green shift happen. I would say that we have a unique closeness to nature combined with a long-standing sense for trade and business. That is how you survive in remote and vast areas with a harsh climate. This also brings a unique innovation system out of need for cooperation over the borders, over different sectors and between industrial clusters. While many talk smart specialization, distance spending clusters and green shift, we do it. It is in essence about making challenges to potentials, creating critical mass for innovation between research, business and society, all fitting so well into the today's overall EU strategy of the Green Deal. Not saying it is easy or that it happens by itself. It is about being smart and sustainable, but also including. Does it need to be done in a socially acceptable way, in balance with other sectors and livelihoods? It needs for sure engaged people and entrepreneurship, but it also needs directed and adapted support. 
It was therefore positive to hear from our national level and ministers earlier today, as we really need to join forces even more. And we can't also underestimate the EU's role for where we, role for where we stand today. Via regional funds and state aid for investments, collaboration and fruitful exchange to build regional capacity. From there also more and more leading research supported by the EU, not to forget crucial investments in infrastructure and broadband. Still vulnerable regions, but with also new self-confidence, I dare to say. It is a fantastic journey we are on to embark. We have probably not seen this kind of activity since the industrialization, but if the industrialization was the cause for the climate crisis, it is today about the opposite, to rebuild for sustainable and greener future. A future that will still need raw material, but smart, clean and circular as such building blocks. We have this afternoon got a lot of food for thoughts, but moreover, it is now really, let's do it. That is to end where I started, to be on top of Europe and in the core of the EU. Thank you all for this great event and the making of it, and with a special thanks to Emma that have kept it all together. Thank you very much, uh, Mikael Jansson, for the, those kind words. Um, and I'd like that. It's increasing this massive development that we see now in northern Swe Sweden and northern Finland. It's really helping increasing the self-esteem of the north. And I think that's, that's true. Thank you, all speakers of all three sessions that we have given today. And uh, thank you all participants and thank you for your comments and uh, thoughts that you shared with us uh, in the chat during the seminar. And this seminar will shortly be available to, to watch uh, on, on the YouTube channel of Svemin. So um, please share the link uh, uh, with your colleagues and friends in your network. So um, I hope we have deepened and broadened the knowledge of how the European Arctic can secure the European Green Deal. If not, please watch us again and again. Lastly, I'd like to show my gratitude to the organizing committee behind this seminar, all the four different organizations. Thank you. That's all for today. So take care and goodbye. <laughs>